get your hymn books. We're going to sing a couple choruses. 702. We'll start with some chorus at the end. You all know them. You probably don't even need the words. You got the third string song leader up here tonight. And we'll sing 702, uh, 3, and 4. We can just sing those right in a row. We can make the transition, right? Well, I'll wait for you. Okay, 702, he owns the cattle. <coughs> four or five more. No, that's all right. We won't do that. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank we can gather in this evening hour, and Lord, we ask your blessing on our time together. Thank you for loving us, caring for Thank you that we do know that you are mighty God. You want to listen to our prayers. You want to answer, uh, but you wait upon us often, and Lord, we pray you to help us to be faithful to you in each of those things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that's it. Uh, let me mention a couple of things. Uh, don't forget the, our uh, sign up outside. The ladies, please sign up for the ladies and little ladies tea. It's coming up, of course, in about two weeks. And we will have uh, invitations for you to give out on Sunday. And you can take those and get out and sign up, please, so that we have a good idea how many we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, have at the, at the banquet. Don't forget as well. Coming up the last, actually the first Sunday in November, uh, first Wednesday, uh, is the Wednesday after Halloween. We have a Halloween party, and or harvest party, whatever what we call it. But we want to have things for the kids. I, there's a couple boxes of candies down there. Uh, please bring in some candies. You, you, you go to Walmart or wherever, they got boxes of those little candy things all over the place. And candies or chips or, I don't know, rutabagas or, or whatever, uh, whatever works. Parsnips or so, parsnips are always good. And uh, so you can... Bring those in, and we'll hand those out on that Wednesday night. We'll make some loot bags up for that Wednesday night. Questions and answers is our topic tonight. Psalm 119, starting with verse 81. Questions and answers. Questions are always an interesting thing. You know, if you ask somebody a question in their mind, they answer it automatically. Say, how tall are you? I won't ask you how much you weigh. You know, what did you have for supper? The answer comes to our mind. And the psalmist here has some questions for God. God does not mind questions. Doesn't like grumbling and complaining. We saw that with the children of Israel. But God doesn't mind questions. And so we, sh we should be willing to ask God. 
God doesn't mind why. God doesn't mind how. God doesn't mind when. Uh, but we see here in these verses some questions and some answers. The psalmist begins, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully, help thou me. They have had almost consumed me upon the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Lord, we ask as we look at your word now that we've all had busy days and responsibilities and pray that you just still our hearts and minds from those and Lord, help us to allow in this time we can come together in the quietness of this evening hour and allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to teach us, to help us. And Lord, we'll give you the praise for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, more and more the verse, this has nothing to do with this, the verse comes to my mind, be still and know that I am God. Be still. We don't like to be still, do we? We, we are a fidget, fidgety people. I don't know, maybe is that the right word? That we just, we can't sit still. I mean, when's the last time you just sat down without your cell phone, without a book, and just sat and thought? Or sat and looked? Watch people. And people are interesting to watch. Be still. We live in a day when it's, it's really pretty hard. Uh, let me mention, uh, Mr. Pickett's going to teach Sunday school again this coming Sunday, and then after that I'm going to start in Exodus. I, I taught through Exodus a bit ago, but I want to look more at some topical things and some practical lessons rather than going through verse by verse, what's it all say? Uh, because these things were written for our admonition. What, what it says, the details are always important, but... I'm going to start in Sunday school and do a little background first and then uh, uh, look at some things. Of course, this coming Sunday is Thanksgiving Sunday as well. And uh, uh, Sunday night we're going to have a prayer and praise and song service. And so you come ready to pray and give a testimony and sing and we'll all do that. And when we get done, we'll all go home. Okay, that'll work. The psalmist has some questions. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that David, a man after God's own heart, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, would have it all figured out? But you know, I don't know anybody that's got it all figured out. I've known some great men of the faith. They don't know who I am. I'm, I'm insignificant. But, but you know, I found that Great men of the faith spend more time asking questions than telling you what they think. Somebody that think they think they're great always spouting, spouting about what they know. But here, David, he asks the question, and there's not a question mark in verse one, but the question is implied there. What if I faint? What if I faint? He says, my soul fainteth for thy salvation. He says, he's not talking about dying. But if he, I, I'm so exhausted. My soul is, is who I am. My intellect. We are a body, a soul, and a spirit. And he says, I feel like I just can't take any more. My body's fine. I can go on for a long time. But I just feel like I can't take any more. I'll lose strength. When I used to travel with the college choir, 
I had one tour we called the, I called the fainting tour because it seems these young ladies, I don't know what their problem was, but uh, two of them right in the middle of things. I remember one standing right in the choir and I look and her eyes start to roll back in her head and she starts to get wobbly and I get up there just time to catch her. And I pick her up and carry her out the back. And then another one, she has a speaking part. And I look at her and she, and this is three or four, probably a week, week and a half later. She, her eyes roll back in her head. And I get up there and catch her and, and I'm carrying her out and I turn around, Mrs. Baker was playing piano. I said, play O Canada or something. And we, I went out. But they couldn't go on. It wasn't that they didn't want to go on. It wasn't physically. It's just the fainting, fainting syndrome, I guess. I only fainted once as I know of in my life. And that was when I was a teenager. The doctor was mean to me and hurt me and I fainted. Dr. Rogers, you have to know him. He's an old horse doctor. But uh, what if I faint? What if I feel like I just can't go on? He says, Psalm 27, you know this verse. It says, I had fainted unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have fainted. I was all, I was all set to. My eyes were starting to roll back. But I saw the goodness of the Lord. And except that I saw the goodness, I, had, I would just shrivel up in a puddle on the floor. He says in this, my soul fainteth for thy salvation. Now he's not, you know, saved does not always mean changing our destination from hell to heaven. Uh, you know, the, we are being saved in this life. We're being saved from the effect of sin in this life. We call something we call it sanctification. But he says, my soul fainteth. Why? I need your help. I need your help. And we don't know what exactly the circumstances, because I think each one of these little sections speaks of different circumstances. But he says, you know, I'm in trouble. I need your help. When's the last time we just got really serious with God and said, God, I'm in trouble. I need your help. Without your help, I don't know what I'm going to do. One uh, statement I remember long ago was each time we work out our own salvation, we find it harder to depend on God. Now, that's not talking about working out how to get to heaven. You know that. But work out our salvation from circumstances. You know, there's an old saying again, we ought to pray like everything depends on God and work like everything depends on us. And so the psalmist says that the circumstances of life, and we don't know what they were, were causing him to faint. We just feel like quitting. But we see the positive side there. Look at that. But. I always like that word in the Bible. But. The contrast. I hope in thy word. I hope. Remember the word hope, though, is not a wishful thinks kind of happy thing, but a confident expectation and a definite outcome. I know because I trust in your word. That word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. That God says his word is sure, secure, steadfast. He says, I put my hope in your word. If I didn't put my hope in your word, I would faint. I would just shrivel up. You know, we're getting a place in, in society where we have to say that with a, as a general rule. And we always should have been saying that. But when we see things going on, we hear of things happening, 
We hear of things that are totally contrary to morality, to the word of God, to decency, are accepted as normal and promoted. Then we can do nothing else but hope in the word of God. He says, verse 82, Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou come unto me? My eyes fail. He says, I'm looking. I'm looking for your word. I'm looking for an answer. I'm looking for wisdom. I'm looking for direction. Do you ever think sometimes that maybe God leaves us looking just a little bit because we pay a whole lot more attention to him then than, than other times? You know, what, what would we feel like if someone that said they, they loved us, they cared about us, the only time they spoke to us is when they wanted something? Other than what? Not a word. No please, no thank you, no conversation. Just, I need this, I want this, give me this. I think God sometimes allows things, I don't think he's being mean about it. Allows things to go on a little bit because we actually will have a conversation with God. We'll actually spend time with him. Because we know the answer is only in his word. The only answer is only able to come from him and through him. He says, when wilt thou comfort me? When will my troubles end? 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight. A little hard to do sometimes. A little hard financially sometimes. Hard sometimes with our health. We could list a number of other things. To walk by faith and not by sight. We can't see the end from the beginning. And so we have to walk by faith. We walk by faith in this world with a circumstance. We walk by faith in finances. I said Canada's likely going into recession. If it's not already. You know, you know, they say it's a recession is when you lose your job, a depression is when I lose my job. You know, that's I guess that's the technical difference. I don't know. But uh, the economy's not getting much better. Interest rates, inflation, everything going up. But we should walk by faith. David said, I was, been, I was young and I'm old. But I have not seen the righteous for seek, sake and their seed by begging bread. Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Paul, Paul told the church at Philippi, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, that's not a universal promise. That's a promise to the church at Philippi because they were faithful in giving to the work of the ministry. And he says, they first gave their own selves. So what if I can't see my salvation? When will my troubles end? We see verse 83, the question there, is, again, is not stated in that verse, but how long will I be able to endure this? He's using a, a illustration there that we don't as much understand here in the, in the 21st century. He says, for I am become like a bottle in smoke. A bottle. Now we think of a bottle, we think of a glass jar. But that's not what he's talking about. They didn't have glass jars back then. They had leather skins that they would put something in. Uh, They would put all kinds of different things in these leather skins. And if you take that leather skin and you put it in the smoke and the heat and just leave it there, it draws all the moisture out of it and begins to shrivel and become hard and not pliable, not easy to use. And that's what he's saying. I feel like I'm a bottle in smoke. I feel like I'm kind of shriveling up inside. I feel like I'm I'm harder than I used to be. 
I don't feel I'm as usable as I used to be. And again, he's talking about how I feel. Psalms, poetry, are about how people feel. And the psalm is really honest about how he feels. But he says, in the midst of that, I feel hard, I feel shriveled up, I feel useless. But, look at the next, look at the next part of that verse, yet do I not forget thy statutes. I have not forgotten the guardrails, the guide rails. I understand that they've changed the definition here in Newfoundland. They'll steal things along the road. They're not guardrails anymore. They're guide rails. They're simply a guideline that you're supposed to stay between them. They don't really guard you against anything because a good car can plow right through them without much difficulty. But they are there. But God says, I've got statutes. I've got laws, ordinances, instructions. He says, I haven't forgot those, but this is how I feel. You know, God cares about how you feel. God cares if you feel disappointed. God cares if you're unhappy. God cares if you're happy. God, you know, God gave, you know, God gave us feelings, didn't he? He made us that way. And we all have them. Sometimes men don't like to admit we have feelings. Uh, we'll leave, I'll leave that to the women folk. They can have feelings. I don't want to have feelings. But we all do. So when I feel shriveled up, hard, useless, where should I turn? To the word of God. To the statutes of God. To the precepts. To his testimonies to the word. Verse 84 has two question marks in it. He says, How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecuted me? Why do you allow those who persecute to continue? Why, why do you allow this problem to continue, God? We've all had problems that have sometimes plagued us for years. Sometimes it seems almost generations. Why does God allow those continue? Let me just... give you an answer, not, not in this verse. But the Bible says there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But well, God, with the temptation, also make a way escape that you may be able to bear it. God doesn't allow anything in your life that you're not equipped to handle. The testings, the trials, God allows them, and sometimes God allows them to continue. He knows you can handle it. And he knows that by us responding properly to those circumstances... Others will see, and he will be glorified because others will understand. He is a God that sees, that answers, and he gives his Christian strength to deal with all those circumstances on a daily basis. It's, I've been around long enough to see saved and unsaved people in basically the same set of circumstances and see almost totally different reactions. Why? We have the Holy Spirit of God. Christ said he would give us another comforter. We have the promises of the word of God. Can you imagine living through this life? Number one, not knowing what's going to happen in eternity. But also not having the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God to help us, to encourage, to strengthen, to, to witness to us on a daily basis of God's goodness. He says, God, you have the power to deal with my enemies. Why don't you? We ask that question too, don't we? And I'm not talking about enemies that will come beat you up, but 
There are a lot of different kinds of enemies. And again, I, I think we go back to that thought. God does not give us any more than we can handle. And God wants us, as we handle that scripturally, spiritually, as a saint of God, to give him the glory for giving us the ability and for helping us to go through those circumstances. Why do you allow those that persecute to continue? Questions in the first four verses. Then we see some answers. Verse 85, the proud have dig pits against me, which are not after thy law. Sounds like a strange thing. The proud have dig pits for me, it says, which are not after thy law. Pits were, though sometimes it was a well, sometimes they dug a hole in the ground to dig out some dirt or rocks or something. But he says, which are not after thy law. Go back to Exodus 21. The Bible's all one book, so you have to compare scripture with scripture. Moses is given instructions here, and he says in verse 33, if man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it, and an ox or an ass fall therein, the owner of that pit shall make it good, and shall give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. Now they're assuming that a man's smart enough, he's not going to fall in the pit. But he says, if you open a pit, and somebody else's animal falls in that and dies, you're responsible. You know that same truth is a legal principle today. I knew a man that had a gravel pit. It was a flat field. I knew, I knew a place well. Uh, it was not far from where I grew up. He had a gravel pit. And one night the, that this fellow was hopped up on drugs, he decided he was going swimming. So he ran and dove in the gravel pit. Guess what? It wasn't as deep as he thought. He was badly injured. He sued the man that owned the gravel pit. Even though he was trespassing, even though he was high on drugs, the man that owned the gravel pit had to pay him because he didn't put a fence around the pit. And the same thing here, he says, I know the truth of God's word. The proud have dig pits for me. Those that think they are really something. Pride is a whole nother, whole nother topic. But those who think they are, they know more than everybody else, they're more spiritual than everybody else, they're better than everybody else, and we put a lot of different things there. The proud have dig pits. Pits in life. Something you can fall into without any fault of your own. He said, they, they've, they've dig pits. And it's a danger to me. You know, we're not, we, don't, we didn't have lights outside like we do now. People didn't have car lights or flashlights or anything else. He says, it's a danger. He says, God has made restrictions. So the psalmist knows the answer. Those who live a life of pride are always trying to trip up somebody else. But God has made restrictions. Look at verse 86. He knows where his hope comes from. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. He knows where his help comes from. Now, verse 86, the first part I think refers back to the thought about pits. All thy commandments are faithful. God's gave a commandment. 
back in Psalm, I mean, in, in Exodus 21. It's faithful. It's right. It's the proper thing to do. So all your commandments are faithful. And all the commandments are faithful. We, you know, we said Moses had 613 commandments, I think. And we've got just a few things that, you know, compared to 613, I, I wouldn't even want to try to start memorizing 113, let alone 613. Some have tried. But the things God calls on us to do are, are pretty simple. He calls us to live a separated life. He calls us to, as a Christian, to be baptized, join a church, faithful in tithing, be good in our testimony. You know, simple things. He says, I know all your commandments are faithful. But in the midst of that, there's still a problem. He says, they persecute me wrongfully. Now, there's some times when we are not persecuted or attacked wrongfully. Sometimes we deserve it. We lose our temper and go off our head as we say. We deserve it. If we're not honest, we deserve it. But he says, they're persecuting me wrongfully. There, there's no, who are persecuting me? The proud, back in verse 85 again. I've done nothing worthy of their wrath. But I know help, where my help comes from. He says, help thou me. God, I need your help. Look at verse 87. He knows enemies may attack, but they do not have the final say. They had almost consumed me upon the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Almost. Almost. Maybe it'd be a good Bible study sometimes to study that word almost in the Bible. Remember when Paul was testifying before, I forget, Felix or one of those, he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He said, almost. Consume, I, was, I was almost done. My life on earth is in God's hands. They do not the proud do not term, determine my destiny. It's, it's something that losing your temper. If we lose our temper, you know what that's showing? Someone else is controlling us. Do you ever know somebody that you knew they had these triggers and you could just say about four words and they would just go off? Why? You were controlling them. Or maybe that was us and they were controlling us. But here he says, the proud do not determine my destiny. Those who set themselves up as arbiters of right and wrong without God's help do not control my destiny. My security, he says, but I forsook not thy precepts. My security is keeping the precepts of God in bad circumstances. It's in the normal walk of life, if you will, we aren't terribly tempted usually to go off the road, if you will. Two times in life that we are tempted to go in the ditch, if you will. One is when things are going so well we don't have a care in the world. That we think that we've got it made, I'm, you know, I'm happy as a lark and I can do what I want and you know, nothing's going to happen and we run off into the ditch. The other time is when things go bad. Things go bad, we always try to find somebody to blame besides ourselves. We blame God usually. And, and, but he says, you know what? I was in rough shape. 
They had almost consumed me on the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. I did not set those things aside. Verse 88 just turns the, the whole thought at the end of this. Quicken me after thy loving kindness. So shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. All these bad things he's talked about in the first seven verses. Hasn't been an easy life. There have been problems. There have been difficulties. There have been the proud. There have been pits. There have been all kinds of trouble. Quicken. Quicken is give me life. Give me abundant life, if you will. Give me a life serving God. Quicken me after thy loving kindness. I like the rest of that, that last phrase. After thy loving kindness. Do you know God, everything God does in your life comes from a heart of love? Everything comes from a heart of love. Sometimes we do things because we're angry, spiteful, disappointed, upset. My wife and I went to a restaurant a while ago. I just have a rule. I don't, restaurants are divided up usually between a, a bar section and a restaurant section. I don't sit in the bar. I just don't. I, I'm not tempted to drink when I go in there, but I'm just, I'm just not going to do it. We walked into a restaurant, nice restaurant here in town, and it was maybe two in the afternoon, and walked in and greeted the girl. She smiled at us, and she said, uh, I said, she said, I said, two, and she said, okay, right this way, and she tried to take me to the bar. I said, no, I want to sit over here. She said, that section's closed. I said, but I don't want to sit in the bar. She said, that section's closed. I didn't respond as well as I should have. I just turned around and walked out. I didn't respond in loving kindness. I know I should have. I know you probably would have, but I didn't. I didn't say anything mean to her. I went to another restaurant and spent my, spent my money there because they didn't tell me I had to sit in the bar. You see, God always does what he does out of loving kindness for us. Sometimes out of loving kindness, there has to be some correction. Sometimes out of loving kindness, things are going to have to hurt a little bit. When my children were little, we had a little dog, a Norwegian elk hound. Her name's Daisy. And Daisy was, oh, she's about that big, but she's a powerful little dog. She got in the road and got hit by a car, broke her back leg. So I was, I was working then. I asked my sister-in-law to take, him, take her to the, I was going to say take her to the dentist, no, the veterinarian. The dentist wouldn't do anything. But, uh, and out of loving kindness for the dog, he set that, he did surgery, he cut open her leg and did surgery and reset the bone and all that. And it wasn't very pleasant for that dog, but it was done out of loving kindness. Sometimes with us, we get out and do something foolish and God has to, out of loving kindness, do some surgery, if you will. But it's always out of loving kindness. God always acts in love and kindness. I so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. I mean the testimony. Remember we said testimony is what God said is true? God, I will listen to what you say is true. I will depend on what you say is true. And I will keep it. Because I know out of loving kindness, you've allowed these things to come into my life. Out of loving kindness, you're going to see me through these things. Because you, you love me. Because you're God. You see the end from the beginning. We don't see the end from the beginning. Did you ever get in a situation and you just kind of wonder, how is this all going to end? And your thought is, this is not going to end well. But... 
you factor God out. And God in his loving kindness comes in, changes people, changes heart, changes circumstances. And God works through each of those things uh, for you. Lord, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for these psalms and the honesty of the psalmist as he writes each of these sections, these verses. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to learn from them, learn about our lives. And Lord, when we feel like we're going to faint, Lord, we would trust in you. We would get our strength from you and strength from your Holy Spirit and continue on in your service so we wouldn't quit. Lord, we thank you for this time. We can come and bring our requests before you. Pray that you'd use them now for your honor and glory in Jesus' name.